Speaking next is Dr. Pamela Conrad, Deputy Principal Investigator and Investigation Scientist for the um, MSL, Mars Science Laboratory Curiosity Sample Analysis. Uh, and her discussion will be, is Mars a habitable planet? And what Mars Science Laboratory is teaching us? Welcome, Dr. Conrad. No, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Thank you. So Curiosity has been on Mars for three years now, and it's kind of old hat. So given the audience, I'm going to skip over a lot of basic things about Mars Science Laboratory because I'm going to make the assumption you know them. And if you have a question, feel free to just shout it out either while I'm talking, and I will leave some room at the end as well. The most important thing that I hope you'll take away from this very, very quick tour of how we're looking at the problem of habitability on Mars um, is that every mission works together with every other mission. So everything we've ever done on Mars informs everything that we are now doing, and everything that we are now doing will inform what happens next. And because this mission is my first Mars mission, it's really exciting to be working on the Mars 2020 mission and see how the linkages work from what we're doing every day right now to what I imagine we'll be doing when we land in 2021. And I'm also participating in the science objectives development for the human mission that we're projecting in the 30s. So just to remind you once again of what Jim just said about this first landing site workshop happening at the end of October in Houston, these are publicly open. Submit an abstract if you have your favorite site on Mars or just go and participate. Same thing for Mars 2020. The public is invited. You don't get paid to go, but you can advocate for your science. Now, what I want to show you here is an unofficial version of our latest selfie where we are at this area called Lion, which we just recently left. Uh, Doug Ellison put this together. The uh, team that that took the official images that make up this mosaic is, uh, is still tweaking it, and uh, it may be released as early as today. I can't remember uh, where they are in the process, but uh, this is an unofficial version, and you can see the shadow of the arm of Curiosity rover on which the MOLLE, the Mars hand lens imager, sits. And uh, there we are looking at our outcrop. We have since left, and we're on to the next thing. Um, I don't know this computer, and there's no controls here. Oh, I see. If you click on this, you can get them to. Yeah. How does this thing work? Awesome. Uh, this doesn't fit on the screen. Okay. All right, so a very quick history of what we've been doing. When we landed, we took our time deciding what we were going to do, and we figured that the most interesting place to go was actually in the opposite direction of where we had planned to go. We planned to go up this central mound in Gale Crater, which we informally call Mount Sharp. Its official name is Aeolus Mons. And we went to this place, which was in the opposite direction, because it was a junction of three different types of rocks, and we thought we'd get a lot of bang for the buck to look at these contacts between these different types of rock. And we did. When we got there, we studied the mineralogy and the chemistry of the materials, and we determined from the mineralogy and the chemistry that at the time that material was deposited as sedimentary rock, the waters were relatively neutral, the chemistry had no show-stopping, awful stuff that would be um, an impediment to Earth life, and that if we use as a standard the most robust, cosmopolitan, and tolerant life that we have on Earth, which is microbial eukary uh, prokaryotes, this kind of environment might have been able to support such life, subaqueously, that is, in water. That doesn't mean we have proof of a habitable environment, but it means the chemistry and the mineralogy suggest that those conditions would be supportable for life. If you look at 
the list that I have here of the kinds of environmental requirements for life. What you see in the red one is the highlight chemical, and that's because that's what we were able to measure. We can, to some extent, measure spatial characteristics, but we have a very hard time going back in time to look at the physics of the environment. And that should be of particular interest to you, given the last talk where everything went to hell because of the physics, the abrasion, the wind, the power of physics to constrain the chemistry that we need to conduct to be alive is significant. So we can't forget to measure the physical aspects of the environment when we're looking for the requirements for habitability. When you look at the parts where it says spatial and temporal, that will become clear in a second what I mean by that. Some of the chemical requirements that uh, are typified when we talk about these things on Earth have to do with what chemical elements living things tend to use. There's a long list of dependencies. You need certain chemical elements to make certain kinds of compounds. To make certain kinds of chemical bonds, you need a certain set of environmental conditions. If you take a look on the left at this list of biological abundance chemistry, and then you take a look on the right at the crustal abundance, you'll see some differences. But the main message I want you to get from this is that you are where you live, and you make the life out of the chemicals that are available that aren't busy doing something else. So every time I give a talk about life on other planets or habitability of other planets and somebody asks, couldn't you have silicon-based life? I say, it's not impossible. But it's improbable because the silicon is busy. The silicate tetrahedron, which is the basis for silicate minerals, is so ubiquitously found throughout the observable universe. When we look at meteorites, we sil see silicate materials in there. So silicon is busy, and it gets bound really strongly. And it's energetically really expensive to take it out of the minerals. So carbon, which is available because it's found less often in these kinds of minerals is a much better chemical element. It's easy to get a covalent type of bonding. You can share electrons. And if nothing else, what life does is buy and sell electrons. That's how we do the business of metabolism. The physical factors that I'm talking about are legion. The worst kinds of physics at the surface of Mars right now are the extreme uh, high energy radiation, um, the extreme fluctuations in temperature, um, and a few other things. And the, ma the, the, the most amazing thing about Mars with um, respect to Earth in that regard is that when you look at the timing of the evolution of the two planets, and you see that early on Mars lost its geomagnetic field it's almost as though the planet got killed because the dynamics in the interior of the planet became quiescent. You lost the protective magnetic field, and then all of the harsh radiation from which Earth is protected uh, just pounds the surface of Mars. So it's very interesting to look at the divergent path that two uh, nascent planets took as they formed, as they matured, as they cooled, as they off-gassed. One of them continued to have a lot of interior dynamics, and the other one, eh, not so much. Here's a list of some of the kinds of physical requirements I'm talking about. Uh, radiation I talk about a lot, but there's a lot of other stuff too. If you go out into the field on Earth in a sparsely populated area, and you see the microbes that are living on pebbles or on the surface of rocks, you notice a couple of things right away. One, they don't always follow the water, or that is the slope of the rock. Sometimes they follow the light. They're situated on the surface of the rock, so they get the most sunlight if they're photosynthesizers. Another thing you see is that in areas where it's too dynamic, too much slope, like on the side of an alluvial fan, right on the front part of the fan where stuff is continuously falling down, there's not as much life as on the sides of the alluvial fan where you tend to accumulate a little moisture, it tends to be a little more stable, and the life doesn't keep getting pounded by more rock and silt and sand. 
So even things like slope and stability have an effect on whether or not an environment is fully habitable or only in a patchy way. Okay, I told you I'd tell you a little bit more about spatial requirements. Take a look at this image on the right. That's a, just a very extreme close-up on a scanning electron microscope image of the rock that's on the left. Uh, that's a sandstone in a battleship promontory in the McMurdo Dry Valleys in Antarctica. And what you see there is a lot of pore space. And you see these kind of globular grains, right? A lot of microorganisms live in the surface of that rock, the shallow subsurface down to about a centimeter. And that's because there's enough pore space to retain water and chemicals and allow the waste products to diffuse away. If you don't have rock with sufficient porosity, you can't have microbes living in the rock because they'll drown in their own poo and they won't be able to retain nutrients. So this is important. If we were on Mars and we were looking for refugium environments inside rock, what we'd want to do is look at some of the physical characteristics like the grain size to determine which rock might be appropriate to harbor microorganisms. So space is important. The temporal, I'm not going to make a slide of that. I'm just going to tell you that you have to have the same stuff in the right place, and it all has to be at the right time. Because you could have a bunch of water on the surface and not have a bunch of something else you needed, and it would still be uninhabitable. So that begs the question, if Mars has suffered significant atmospheric loss early in its history, how the heck did we manage to keep liquid water on the surface? So the timing of the water and the timing of the atmospheric loss is kind of mysterious right now because we've actually dated some of the stuff on Mars now. The sample analysis at Mars investigation did an experiment that our um, participating scientist uh, co-investigator Ken Farley cooked up and we've actually dated the materials radiometrically and looked at their exposure age. Now when you date sedimentary rock, that is clastic or that is bits of older rock, what you really get is the age of the crystals of the older rock. So we don't have a very tight constraint, but we have a better constraint than we did before we did this experiment. Gale Crater is of a particular age, and the age of it is after lots of atmosphere went away. How did water sit there? I don't know the answer to that. Anyway, let me crank right on through this because I don't want to take up too much time. This map tells you basically the path that the rover has taken since landing. And the Yellowknife Bay is pointed in the upper right-hand corner at about uh, 2 o'clock. And where we are right now is the bottom of the line there. Or actually, we're a little bit further than that uh, because we drove yesterday and we drove the day before yesterday and we're cranking along uh, to go higher up Mount Sharp. The road is not a straight shot. You might wonder why it takes us so long to get any one place on Mars. Well, part of it's because us pesky scientists keep wanting to stop and look at stuff. The amazing stuff that Viking did was limited by the lander that Viking biology experiment sat on. So Viking could look at where Viking was. What we have looked at tells us that you have to keep moving and get more samples. We couldn't do that in the mid-70s. We can do it now, and mobility is key to getting a large sample population. We've hardly looked at any of Mars. There's a ton of Mars to look at. How dare we presume that we know that Mars is or is not habitable, or is or is not conducive to human exploration and maybe even colonization? How do we know? Well, we make models. That's how we do all of science. And the models keep being informed by the new stuff we learn. So I'm digressing a little bit too much here. Just to tell you about this path, the point is even when we are moving, it's not quite so smooth as in the last map. In this image, which is from the high-rise camera that's on board Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, we can see where we are. We have even been able to, at times, visualize our rover. But what you see in the line that I've uh, kind of darkened in yellow is the path that we've taken. If we were to zoom in tightly, what you'd see is sand dunes, um, drifts, sharp rocks, smooth rocks, slopes, little rises. There's all kind of stuff that you have to negotiate all the time. 
And that stuff slows you down even when you're having a saw where all you're doing is driving. The most you can get done in any given day without running out of energy and running out of daylight is limited by how rough the terrain is. If you're on a smooth stretch, you can go a long way. We're not on a smooth stretch. We're looking for the interesting stuff. We recently explored an area uh, with a contact between two different rock types that are, is quite interesting because there are heavy amounts of veins that were injected through the rock, and we're trying to understand what this contact means. In geology, every time you see a distinct, conten uh, a distinct contact, it means there's been a change in conditions. So in sedimentary deposition, if you can see where one thing stopped and one thing started, it tells you the conditions changed. And by some of the character of the rock, you know a little bit about what that change might have entailed. And by the way, all these images that I'm showing you are publicly released. I'm going to, at the end, show you a link where you can get uh, the information every day. This rock is especially interesting in the area where we were because it has a higher ratio of silica to other materials in the minerals. The high silicate content is really important for a couple of reasons. The first reason is a lot of the rocks we've studied on Mars definitively with our X-ray diffractometer Kemen are pretty much basaltic minerals. That is the kind of basic rock forming mineral like we make in the ocean makes up the majority of the rock. Basalt has lower silica content than some of the more evolved or fractionated rocks Every time you make a rock that's igneous, the leftover materials that haven't made it as a, into crystal form yet form the next kind of rock. And then as you make more and more rock, the more evolved the rock is, it tends to have more silica. So this is interesting because this rock has more silica. What precisely it means, we don't know yet. We're working on the scientific interpretation. Now we're moving, like I said, we drove yesterday, we drove today. Uh, further and further uh, towards our, our goal, which is as high on Mount Sharp as we can get before we die. Uh, before we get there, we're going to examine some dunes called Bagnold, and we're going to do a series of studies on the lee side and the Stoss side of the dune and see what we can understand about those dynamics. I think the most important thing about the dune is that when you look at consolidated material in a rock relative to the unconsolidated material, you want to understand how the environmental conditions of the, let's see, how do I put this, of the active materials are on the surface to try to come up with a model for what's happening as you make rock in the era where you don't actively have liquid water on the surface. The reason why that stuff is important is because if you want to know how to preserve chemicals that have hydrocarbons in them, or what we call organic molecules, you need to be able to somehow withstand not only the radiation, but the abrasion, other types of chemistry. You know ever since the Phoenix um, mission that the surface of Mars has this material. We think it's perchlorate, but it's certainly an oxychlorine compound. It's like scrubbing the surface of Mars with Clorox. But what's so interesting about that is every time we drill a hole, and this color is kind of weak in here, but can you see that the tailings of the hole are gray? I mean, this Clorox stuff, it's not really Clorox, okay, that's hypochlorite, but I like to call it Clorox. It, whether it's some kind of metal perchlorate or whether it's some other kinds of oxychlorine, oxidized chlorine, but not sodium chloride, which is table salt, that chlorine does a lot of damage. You know how water rusts a lot of stuff? Well, these oxychlorine compounds also do a similar kind of thing. They oxidize everything. So it's very harsh environment chemically as well as energetically from the cosmic rays and the UV. But look at this gray stuff. It's just under the surface. So this is just, this bad stuff is just skin deep. There could be lots of cool stuff right under the surface. And by cool stuff, I mean the potential for a refugium environment for microbes. If there were microbes on the surface before Mars became so harsh right at that surface atmosphere interface, they could have gone inside. So it's very encouraging to see this gray stuff every time we drill down. 
This is just a little update of what we've done recently. Um, right now, I told you we're driving, but that doesn't mean we're not doing science while we go. Our chemistry camera, otherwise known as ChemCam, which is a laser-induced breakdown spectrometer, zaps rocks at a distance and gives us an idea of their chemical components at the elemental level. We also have the uh, dynamic albedo of neutrons experiment, which is a Russian contributed instrument on curiosity, and it pings neutrons down and tries to get a measure of the hydrogen, which is a proxy for water, and chlorine at a profile uh, about a meter under the rover. We also have the CHEM-MIN X-ray diffractometer, which is giving us definitive min mineralogy because we scooped up a bunch of that stuff that we drilled from the lion hole, and it's in the portioner in our arm. Kemen has already made several measurements, and it's analyzing the mineralogy. And we, even as we speak, are getting the tactical plan together to deliver some of this stuff to the sample analysis at Mars investigation, the one I work on, and the one Jen Stern will talk about in a couple of minutes. And then we'll take a look at that from the evolved gas uh, perspective to see what the chemistry is in those materials of the lion uh, sample. So I want to just give you a quick summary of how I look at the habitability potential of Mars, and then I'm going to um, stop and do the questions part, because I wanted to give you ample time to talk about the habitability potential. First of all, I'll come at out and say that I don't have high hopes for anything on the surface of Mars just now. That doesn't mean we might not have at one time, but it's not so good right now because of the radiation, because of this oxychlorine stuff, and because of lots of other things that are challenging even to the most uh, tolerant microbes. One of them is this uh, huge diurnal swing of temperature it's true that we can have, as a spore, very resistant uh, to thermal change organisms, but not as not viable. The other thing that I think about the surface of Mars right now is that because it's so dynamic and you're moving both dust and sediment and larger grain size stuff, lots of things may be buried that would be uh, ancient trace fossils. And, and we see, even on the deck of the rover, uh, lots of deposition of material on a daily basis. And as Jim said earlier, when you get a dust storm, you blow away some of that. But you have to think of Mars as a very dynamic environment. Unfortunately, our meteorology station informs us about what's going on thermally, what's going on with relative humidity, what's going on with UV radiation, and so forth. And we'll have an even more beefy um, meteorology package on the Mars 2020 mission. Um, that's one of the instruments I'll be involved with, uh, uh, and it's called the Mars Environmental Dynamics Analyzer. I advocate doing this on every single mission in every single place we go. Viking started that trend, and that was the right thing to do. Everything you measure is a function of a variety of factors, physical and chemical, and only a comprehensive approach allows us to fully characterize the Martian environment. So. Like I said, I don't think there's a lot of life sitting out on the surface of Mars. I really think that if we want to look for life, we have to go down. I don't know whether there is or there isn't. I think the jury is out. Could humans explore the surface of Mars? Yes. I think that the planning that we are doing is absolutely in the right direction. I'm very excited about the first landing site workshop that we're going to have down in Houston the end of October. I hope I'll see some of you there. And now. Let me give you a few links to some cool stuff. First of all, the mission website, uh, which is just basically mars.jpl.nasa.gov forward slash MSL. Uh, you'll get the latest and greatest there. We do a press release pretty much every day. Everything that we see, you see also on the raw images. You can click the link on images on that website and downlink them, high resolution or lower resolution. This one, eyes.nasa.gov, curiosity underneath that is so cool. You're going to love this. Uh, you can control the rover. You can get 3D views of stuff. You can deploy the instruments and uh, do uh, experiments. The one underneath it, also new. The bottom two, by the way, we just rolled out in celebration of our third anniversary. Uh, this marstrek.jpl.nasa.gov 
Uh, it has the sites mapped out where we've collected science data. You can zoom in, you can get the data, and you can perform your own data analyses. By the way, you're also welcome to propose to any of the Mars data analysis programs to actually be funded to look at existing data. And um, I don't know what the dates are of that call, but all that stuff is publicly available on the NASA website. And finally, if you can't get what you need from those uh, links, I've got my email address up there. I promise you I will answer your email. I can't promise you how quickly it will be because sometimes I'm overwhelmed, like today when I'm flying to Europe in a few hours. So thank you for your attention. I'll uh, try to answer any questions you have. And uh, go ahead. Well, he here's the problem. First of all, the partial pressure of what we need out of the atmosphere uh, is very low on Mars. So, you know, mostly nitrogen here, but with a fair bit of oxygen. We can't get that from the Martian atmosphere. So we wouldn't be just directly breathing Martian air. So if, if you're talking about the silts and the dusts, silicate is going to damage human lungs on Mars just as much as it would damage it on Earth. So you'd still need to filter it. And so whether or not you're directly making air from locked up oxygen and rocks, or whether you're filtering and enriching. You're talking about it being very chemically nasty. You're going to get the dust into your capsule, whatever, habitat while you're there. What will it do to your lungs? So the short answer is twofold. The, the part A I answered, which is that silicate dust is extremely dangerous. The second part, which is the oxychlorine material on it, is an oxidant. So the same thing that happens on Earth would happen on Mars. You don't want to breathe in oxidants. So once you have a material bound to a metal cation, it, it's busy. You know, so it's not reactive. But as soon as it hits moisture, it comes apart. It ionizes. And then the reactive part that can oxidize you is bad. That's why we're always taking these antioxidant pills and stuff like that, because it chemically oxidizes us out of the business of metabolism. So yes, you'd have to find a way of scrubbing. La last question, please. OK. Uh, so. Looking at Mars, as I've done for many years, it seems to be very rocky in most places. I'm, I'm, I'm very interested in sort of how much loose soil there is as you've been driving up Mount Sharp. I imagine there was more on the lowlands, less on the highlands. But just sort of, because you know, on Earth, you get meters, tens of meters, hundreds of meters of relatively loose soil before you hit bedrock. What is it like on Mars? So that's a great question. And so there is no definitive answer right now, because we don't drive in deep stuff for the reason that we don't want to get stuck in it. And so whenever we catch a, a dune or something like that, we analyze it carefully. We do a wheel scuff before we go to make sure we won't sink in it. So how much regolith that's above the silt size fraction, we don't know yet. We try to get an idea of that by looking at something called thermal inertia uh, as we get global maps. Uh, but until you get there, you don't have a completely unique answer to know whether it's depth or whether it's grain size. Next.